sin duda que además en esa nueva etapa. Thank you very much, Professor Hector. I'm sure that this stage that Peru is entering hoy, we will be always supporting them. We'll be supporting you as all the Peruvians have been in the streets supporting the presidency of President Castillo uh, to support the a better future for Peru. And we have also been supporting you all from all our different countries, from the Peruvian embassy in our countries. Yes, of course, says Hector. As we've been supporting Cuba, we've been supporting Peru, we've been supporting Colombia, all of us in Latin America are one big family. So after these interventions that have given us both a general and specific picture of our continent, perhaps we can read some of the questions and comments that there are in the chat. And I don't know if there will be other later on to uh, kick off a dialogue. So the first one I have here, um, very informative and exciting presentations that contribute to a new global political thought. Uh, good living or living well. I can enrich this together with Swarak, which is a self-realization from the notion of Jifang, which is liberation, from the notion of Ubuntu, which is I live because you live. It's a mutual equal and independent mechanism. Um, philosophers must engage in in-depth studies and of these long-standing people's traditions of planetary, cultural and ecological civilization. So this was a comment made by Professor Manorang and has also asked us two things. Rather, these are two questions from the Chinese audience, which is one is, could you tell us about the current situation of land reform or the land struggles in Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, and Venezuela? As far as we know, there are still many indigenous peasants who are involved in these struggles. The second is, along with the declining of the US hegemony, there are experiments of de-financialization in different areas now, now. In terms of Latin American integration, I've heard about the experiment of the Bank of the South and Surque. Uh, what's going on with that now? Then we have another comment from Professor Mano, which who says, oh, what a pleasure to coincide with you again. It's a very important webinar. And the professor says that in Mexico, we also have counterparts of Swarak and the good living or living well in the state of Huachaca, who are presently strengthening ties with organizations in struggles in more than 30 countries in Europe. And of course, there are dozens of other versions of these cosmovisions and worldviews that can be incorporated. So I think one has just come in. Let me read it out. What a historic moment for the whole of Latin America. It's a great privilege of history to see the peoples taking the reins of their own fate. An excellent and motivating debate. One ask question, how can we strengthen the mechanisms for facing the, down the power of the media. So with these questions that we have, I think we could start a round of, uh, a round of answers. I can't see Professor Juanacuni yet. So let's start with Laura Capote, then we'll go on with Javier Calderon, and then me, and then we'll go on, we'll end with Ec Professor Hector Bejar. So now Laura, your answers and any other comment. Thank you very much. So I think that the presentations that you, Javier and Hector have made, I think you've made it very clear what, what moment we're going through at the moment. Also in the framework of looking at what the role is, what the role of the organizations is and the role of peasants and individuals in our continent, I think 
it's very important to highlight this, bearing in mind what Javier said with regard to the social composition of the countries in our region, and especially the Andean countries, where we also have a link to the earth, which is not only a productive link, but it is a link that also goes through a whole social construction. Well, in the case of Colombia, this recognition of a peasant individuals are so necessary, this recognition of people who have a link to the world, their, their worldview, their link to the earth and the production. And so this historic flag of our country, which is of our continent rather, which is the land reform and recognition for those who work the land that is so important. I also think it is key that in the case of this forum, we also look at the fact that Latin America continues to be a continent that's been particularly characterized by these people who continue to lead the struggles. In the case of Bolivia, where it's most evident, but we also see them in the resistance uh, against the coup d'etat in 2019 in Bolivia. It's these peasants and indigenous peoples who have gone out to defend democracy and it's they who were struggling against the coup d'etat. It was this important basis of construction of power that the peasants led forward in Bolivia. It was they who led the first symbolic actions like burning the Uyapala. They uh, led, uh, flew the flag for the diversification and the diversity of our nations. And so it's understanding that when we talk about this return to neoliberal conservatism, it, this also has certain shades that perhaps were always there, but now they've been uh, uncovered a bit more because uh, perhaps they were papered over before, but now we're seeing them for what they are, which are clearly fascist, clearly racist, um, with rhetoric and actions that are really aimed at going against uh, indigenous peoples, against poor people, against what really makes us Latin Americans. So this return to neoliberal conservatism or the reactivation of its forms is, what it is, is to restrict freedoms, to try and curb our societies. So, but, and diversity is a sine qua non condition of being Latin American, where we were colonized, we were products of indigenous peoples, we're all diverse, and we received um, we received this slave trade from the Spanish and Portuguese colonizers as well. So this neoliberal conservative project is attempting to attack Latin American identity. And it's trying also trying to uh, move forward the fascist advances that we're seeing in Spain, France, and other European countries that are supposedly examples uh, in, in uh, quote unquote of freedom and democracy, but they are being increasingly taken over by these extreme right wing policies. So our peoples who are historically peoples of struggle uh, have finally been able to see people who symbolize them, like Pedro Castillo in Peru. Um, it's the way he speaks, his language, and he's much more uh, similar to the Latin American people. And so finally, we're able to, through him, embrace and see these ideals of the identity of our large family that we have been building since the integration processes that Nan mentioned, like CELAC and ALBA. But what we need to do is find ways of reactivating these horizons and panoramas and building these utopias. 
to find a way of transforming our continental identity um, as an alternative against the capitalist logic, which is a logic of death and pillaging and attacking the our own identity that we are proud of here in, on this continent. So that's that me for now. Thank you very much, Laura. Now we'll give the floor to Javier um, for him to respond to some of the questions or comments and add anything he wants. Thank you, Hernan. Um, I just, we've done a very brief, quick panorama. I'd like to refer to the topic of land reform. Thank you for putting forward this question because I think that in the case of the Andean countries and Central America and Mexico, this has been a fundamental topic um, uh, that has been discussed since and, uh, in and that has been disputed since the 60s and 70s. Um, the topic of land reform has become the focus of uh, peasant and indigenous organizations, but also political organizations that oppose the neoliberalist and neoliberal and capitalist order. So the struggle for land reform and the construction of a distribution of land and America, Latin America and Central America is key to It's one of the key issues that allowed the development of the peace agreement with the FARC in 2016. The land reform there is aimed at transforming the structure of the power of the earth and certain other more profound issues that go in line with what com my comrade Fer Fernando was saying about good living and living well. So it's not just about uh, delivering land to the peasants, but building and strengthening these territorial processes, the territory of cultures and processes that have historically uh, been there and that have historically been subject to attempts of colonialization. Now, so this is where the peace agreement uh, for Colombia is key. And that's the point that the current government, Duque's government and the sector of power uh, that the current government of Colombia is part of, they opposed this land reform because they are, and they have built their power around this, the income from great large territories in Colombia, which are used for drug trafficking, which are used for money laundering from drug trafficking income, and are used for developing mega projects uh, of mining, extractivist, uh, projects and monocultures. So this sector of power opposes a land reform. Also through the idea of connecting itself with a transnational capital, which is hegemonizing food production, such as uh, Monsanto and other transnational companies. So one of the great or main pillars of the Colombian conflict for decades and now currently is the land reform. It continues to be the land reform. We have seen progress in the fact that there is now a commitment made uh, from a sector of the Colombian state to develop this land reform. A land reform that would deliver 10 million hectares of land to Colombian peasants who are currently in those 
areas using the land and producing crops. There's also um, an advance movement, a movement of advance in Colombia. I can't go too far into detail because of time, but uh, what was, we saw was in the midst of the resistance to neoliberalism, Colombian peasants uh, started supporting this idea of land reform in the 70s, 80s. There was a slogan, land for those who work it, and now it's land, collective land to build common cultures to ensure self-sustainability. So we're moving along this path now, and the indigenous peasant movement that's also Afro-descendant, they're looking at protecting uh, agricultural production areas, uh, protecting peasant areas to produce food. They oppose drug trafficking and corruption the, that comes with the production of cocaine and narcotics, and they, de they dedicate themselves to preserving and protecting these territories. And so we support, of course, our brothers and sisters in that fight. And it's a very important topic, I think, not only for Colombia, but for all Andean Latin American countries. Finally, I'd like to say that, um, just moving on to another topic now, I think this South-South conversation has been so important, particularly because of the topic of the loss of hegemony of the United States in terms of international relations. I think it is fundamental that we start discussing and set space aside to discuss building a new uh, global geometry of the economy and thinking specifically about uh, spaces for South-South cooperation and building projects that are sustainable uh, for cooperation and economic construction that will help and strengthen processes of change and freedom for our peoples. As Hernan explained, uh, the topic of oil dependency and the connections that that implied in the transformation uh, which Chavez called the geometrical power in Venezuela, I think that we could, from Latin America, build a new geometry uh, for, for the world and through conversations with other countries in the global south and to start building it from within among us and to focus on our own economic projects, to make sure they're sustainable so that, and to ensure that our societies can access all their rights, all knowledge of technologies, but also uh, the knowledge and skills of our own peoples. Thank you very much, Javier, for that uh, intervention. So now, I'll give the floor to Professor Hector. Professor Hector, now you may make any comment around the questions or anything else that you would like to add uh, to this discussion. Thank you. Yes, I'd just like to add a brief description. I'd like to try to describe the situation in Peru today. Now, it's a very paradoxical situation. United States has stopped being Peru's main client. Our main client is now China, because China is our main buyer. I'm not going to say anything about the rest. I don't have time, but China is our biggest buyer. Who's the biggest investor in Peru? China. The main investments, the biggest investments made in Peru and land occupation are made by Peru rather by China. Now, who is the owner of what the Peruvians eat every day? United States. And that is key because we eat white bread, wheat imported from the United States. Peruvians are big fans of chicken. We are the biggest enemy of the poor chickens is the Peruvian. 
chicken should be part of our national emblem. Uh, are, the, are our chickens Peruvian? No, they're North American because they eat American wheat, they have American vaccine, they're 80% American, North American rather. And so together with the, the, the what we produce in Peru has been reduced or relegated to the lowest uh, issue lowest um, product rather, like potatoes, etc. They have very low prices. The prices are lower than what it costs to produce them. So the Peruvian peasants who have been fighting for, who fought for a land reform, and Peru had a big land reform in the 70s, um, 7 million hectares were expropriated and transferred to the peasants. These peasant families now are being discriminated against. They don't have credit. They don't have money, they can't enter the market. And when they do enter the market, they do so in very unfair conditions. While in parallel, the Peruvian agricultural industry produces um, delicacies such as asparagus, uh, tomato paste, avocados, and other similar products for Europe and for the United States, grapes, etc. But that's not part of the daily diet of the Peruvians. So we have a very strange economy that needs to be reordered based on the interests of the Peruvian people. This is what this is a challenge that the next government will have, which will come into power at the end of July. And this is what uh, the teacher Castillo himself called a new land reform. When we say new land reform, we're not talking about a new distribution of land. We're talking about a second stage during which we must reconsider the agrarian or agricultural production, reevaluate it, and nationalize the Peruvian diet because the first economic war that will that the enemies of Professor Castillo will wage will be based on diet. When there is no more bread in the shops of Lima, there will be a political crisis. And that bread depends on the wheat importers from North America, because they hold a monopoly in Peru. Because the Peruvian economy is an monopoly economy. So what needs to enter into force are laws that fight against the monopolies that exist in Peru. And these laws exist, but they haven't been implemented fully. So I think the challenge of Peru for the next few years will be uh, the cultural challenge to make sure that the Peruvian people are really represented at the in the government and the economic challenge which will be represented through what the Peruvians eat every day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Becher, for this very clear uh, summary of the challenges that you and we will face in the future. So now to close, I'd like to share a few comments about what we've heard from Laura, Javier, Professor Hector. Now in Venezuela, we have three areas of struggle for the land. On the one hand, when it comes to the urban areas, the cities with the Bolivarian revolution, we had a process of recovery of ownership in terms of urban territories the the poor neighborhoods that have different names in each Latin American country in Venezuela, they have organized and started recovering the history of this territory so that they can promote 
the laws of regulation and ownership of land in cities such as Caracas and the main cities in Venezuela, we have made progress in terms of normalizing the tenants of land. However, this is constantly an area of struggle because rent is one of the areas of interest for the Venezuelan right. This also has to do with the empty or um, idle territories in the cities. The other area of struggle has to do with the farming land. In Venezuela, in the year 2004, began a process of inventory of the land where we mentioned millions of hectares that were part of uh, large ownerships of land, and then began a process of transfer of these lands to farmers. So then we started fighting against uh, large landowners. Very uh, different farming organizations then started taking over this territory. And again, we have here an area of constant conflict. Farm organizations that are fighting for the rights and large landowners that want to take back ownership. Now, this has been regularized. This has regulations and norms, but remains it remains an area of pressure from the right. There are a lot of attacks on peasants and farmers, and they continue. They also continue attacking sectors of the state that are that support these uh, techniques or strategies of land grabbing. And the third area is indigenous people. In Venezuela, we also began first by recognizing indigenous territories, their traditions, their ancestral uh, forms of solving conflicts. There is, There are still areas where we have made enough uh, progress, mainly in areas where there's a conflict with extractivism, for example, in the area of Guajira. And just as we have in different areas of Latin America, there's a struggle that, or the conflict with indigenous people has a lot to do with the extractivism of capitalism. And finally, what I add here as closing comments is in, in Latin America with the entrance of, uh, with the creation of ALBA, CELAC, with other perspective from Venezuela, from Cuba, from Brazil and Argentina, so came up the idea of having financial exchange without involving dollar, the US dollar. So we're talking about local currency and the exchange of goods. This is what was called Sucre. It had certain first stages, certain first attempts, but there was no further progress made. Well, there was also mention of creating a bank for the South as a mechanism of regional collaboration, but this is, again, another project that was paralyzed. I believe this also has to do with the different conflicts in the continent. If you remember, from 2009, we had a new offensive here. I believe that what Evo Morales called the second counterplan, we see a process of breaking down the progressive and alternative projects of the region. And I believe that these projects, the alternative and progressive projects have not yet understood the importance of projects of integration to overcome material challenges. And here there's something important that I wanted to share in terms of challenges. On the first hand, the struggle for land is not just a struggle to create a regulation for this, but rather to create the collective ownership of land. Here in Venezuela, this is a very important uh, mode of struggle. We're talking about the collective ownership of the land. It is not just about 
the paradigm of individual ownership of private property. This is colonial, modern, and it's functional to the logics of the market. In our experience, the only way to really protect the, lo the land is when we have a socially owned land, a collective land that makes it possible for the people to defend and protect and ensure the production on this land. Otherwise, formal private property is nothing but a mechanism of capital to ensure the appropriation of common goods. And another thing that's very important, Hector Becher mentioned this, is the struggle for food sovereignty. It's not just about ensuring everyone eats, which is important enough, but rather to see what are the modes of production, how do we ensure access to seeds and also the modes of production. We have the same problem that Professor Hector mentioned. We consume things that we do not produce. And on the other hand, we do not consume the things that we do produce. So there's a need here to change not only the mode of production, but also consumption and the cultural of consumption. So we need to shift from a matrix of dependency that can lead us to a food sovereignty model that can change the modes of consumption, of production and the modes of life, because this dependent mode of life is functional to the hegemonic uh, model of living. Because for example, we eat chicken, but we don't eat the entire chicken, but rather everyone eats just the leg. So then we need to have transgenic development of having many, many, many legs of chickens for everyone to have what they need. So again, this is not sustainable, just to give a quick example. And finally, something that is essential, again, a challenge that was made clear in the situation of both Peru and Cuba. There is no possibility to defend real democracy if it is not on the streets, a democracy on the streets. If the people from Peru hadn't taken the streets to defend their votes for Professor Castillo, very probably right now, they would have already given the presidency to Keiko Fujimori, the same thing in Venezuela. If we hadn't taken the streets massively to defend the Re Bolivarian revolution, they wouldn't have acknowledged this as it happened in the last few years. We've gone into a stage of not acknowledging people on the streets. And the same thing would have happened in Cuba. I think it was Beatriz who mentioned this, the issue of the dictatorship of hegemonic media, of transnational media. This is a huge problem that we need to take on. I believe we have here a challenge of different tools. Some comrades are making an effort to create alternative sources of information. And on the issue of South-South uh, connection that Javier mentioned, we need to create more tools. With the South-South Forum, we have created South-South dialogues that have made it possible to get to know more about Venezuela and what's happening directly from the protagonist. And in the same way, we need to get to know firsthand what's happening in China. Because right now, we find out about what, what's happening in China through what the CNN says or BCC. So we need to promote this dialogue so that we learn firsthand to continue doing this. Comrades here are doing this effort, but we need to give it more strength. And we need to create also dialogue so that in the South, in Africa, they can know firsthand what's happening in China, what's happening in Peru, what's happening in Cuba. And we may have more clarity on the common challenges, the shared challenges. Fighting against polarization and trying to build different mechanisms that do not involve the dependency on financial capitalism is an essential challenge of today. And this has to do with what we mentioned before, disrupting the consumption models and production models that we have been tied to. Our comrades from the South-South Forum have promoted debates on the importance of traditional medicine. We believe that the importance here is not just about resisting in this moment that is so difficult for life and humanity, 
as we face in these times of COVID, but also to break down the Western paradigm of health and medicine. We need to go back to a way of life that reconfigures the way of relating to nature and to one another in community. And what a professor Wenakumni mentioned to think about the balance and harmony with nature. And I also agree, this is something that we share. I've seen communities in China that have the same paradigm of balance and harmony and seeing communities in the same way that we see in farmer communities in Venezuela, in indigenous people from Bolivia, that a lot of people in at the grassroots level in Peru have been mentioning. So there's a unity here, South-South, that we need to start favoring in resistance to in resistance to capitalism we need to acknowledge the us as a common enemy of humanity we need to build strength this is very important there are a lot of voices from the left that want to depolitize the struggle that want to say the problem is yes uh imperialism that that's not the issue the issue isn't imperialism but we need to fight against, yes, imperialism, imperialism based in capitalism. But to do this, we need to create unity, unity based in building alternatives. Evo Morales mentioned something that I think is very clear. We need to first fight to stop the right, to stop imperialism, but we also need to fight to build governments that are at least anti-imperialist, that they at least defend sovereignty. And on this basis, we need to fight for an alternative project. They talk about plurinational America. I think this is a concept that we can discuss even in the framework of what Samir Amin mentioned, the need to decouple from global capitalism, disconnect the link. I believe the alternative to disconnect from global capitalism has to do with this communal, collective, alternative methods, as we've discussed here very widely. We've have we share these are things that we have in common in africa in asia in different regions of latin america i think that then essentially we need to continue discussing the common thesis to build new ways of political management there is a crisis of political management that we need to go over reconfigure right now evo morales mentions that the party in bolivia mass is a tool for social movements. He states that it's not the party in the leadership, but rather social movements who use the party. I think this is a very interesting way of seeing it. In Venezuela, we believe that the popular forces need to make the party of the party a tool. And politics shouldn't necessarily, there are two things that we usually have problems talking about in Latin America. We believe that parties, political parties, are going to be an important tool of exercising power, but they're not the only tool. The people have different tools and different strategies. We also do not believe that this means then that they are opposed from one another, that there is a distinction between communal construction and the parties and the state. We believe that fighting against imperialism and defending life requires unity of all forces parties, social movements, organized people, and the thesis of building communal power. This needs to become hegemony. And to do that, we need unity with all of the different tools in this conflict and dispute. And that's why many of the things that we mentioned today, they should be part of a common agenda in the struggle. We believe today that fighting against capitalism is defending life. Fighting against imperialism is defending life is what our people are doing on the streets. Yesterday, we woke up with Cuban people on the streets defending the right to sovereignty and the supposed democracy that the West keeps talking about. It's the dictatorship of capital. In this period of difficulty, this difficult period of COVID, the most wealthy people have become even more wealthy and they have defended their interests against the interest of majorities. So the interest of majorities will be defended in the global South and with an alternative built by the majorities. So I think 
we will need to continue these debates in other channels, in other ways, with other tools. We'd like to thank the invitation to uh, Jade Kinchi, the entire team responsible for this uh, opportunity, to our comrades who are now involved in the interpretation, to Xiaomei, Yang Wo. Thank you, everyone, for the opportunity.